Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef and I am thrilled you're here. You're going to get tremendous value from my friend that we're interviewing today. His name is Ferris Musa and uh, he's, he owns 800 doors, got another 800 that uh, he's, he's looking to close on before too long, uh, based out of Houston. Um, very interesting background because he started in tech and then moved into multifamily. Um, so I, without further ado, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, Rod, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We're going to have some fun today. Uh, Ferris actually spoke at uh, one of my recent events. He was on a panel up on stage and uh, he's a member of my multifamily boardroom mastermind and uh, uh, added a tremendous amount of value there as well. Uh, so Ferris, talk about your background because it's an interesting story. Let's start there like we normally do on the show and, and Tell us yeah. how you got into this business. No, it's, it's, I guess I maybe had a unique spin into it. I mean, my background really always been in tech. I know at one point in time, I wanted to be a doctor like my dad, got into, you know, major, started biology major at, at UT Austin and then realized I just, I'm not a memorization guy, I'm much a more problem solver guy. So got back into computer science, it was a natural fit. And, you know, from that went on and worked at Microsoft for a couple of years, loved it. And, you know, whenever I first started, I told myself three years and I'm out. Cause I've always been entrepreneur at heart. I had my own business kind of high school. So three and a half years into it, I, you know, I left, moved on from Microsoft, left on good terms, you know, still were, you know, really enjoyed it, met great people there and started a software company. And then from that really, you know, I was moving back to Houston. I had extra capital and you know, what does, what do people do, right? You start to learn how to invest that. And so, you know, I'd already been invested in the stock market and I was looking at something better than that. And so I started with a single family space. And so, uh, before I moved back to Houston, you know, I had a fourplex under contract, really got a taste for what multifamily looks like. And then, you know, kind of went on to buy a bunch of different houses and then realized it just doesn't scale. So, you know, from that, um, you know, ended up focusing a lot more on real estate and really, you know, decided to get into apartments. And luckily- This is all a, in Houston? This is all in Houston originally. Okay. So kind of grew that portfolio out. And then, you know, single family, there's definitely money to be made if people are successful there. Sure. But it's just, you know, it's a grind. I mean, you know, from if you have 10 properties, you have 10 different insurances, 10 different mortgages, 10, you know, it's a lot more kind of hands-on. Speak, speak into the choir on that one, brother. Yeah. And so, um, you know, so then I made it, you know, decided to move into multifamily. I made an offer on a small 30 unit in Conroe, which is just north of Texas. Luckily did not win that one. And then, you know, learned about syndication and loved it. Right. And, you know, kind of met my partner, Ben, and we just kind of ran with that and started the Disrupt Equity. So talk about the first uh, deal that, so you went right into, from single family into a, doing a syndication? Yeah. That was your first multifamily. So talk about that first deal. Let's, let's, let's d d dig into that one a little bit. When yeah. was it? How many units was it? Talk about the deal. Yeah, it was about a year ago. It was a hundred unit deal in Atlanta. And, you know, I mean, it's all about your team, right? Uh, you know, I was able to start with a hundred unit deal because guess what? My partner had experience before that, right? And you know, we kind of, we met each other, we both complement each other's strengths and really, you know, realized kind of together, right, we're, you know, 5x versus just 1x doing their own thing. And so we did that and ran with it. And so I kind of really brought a lot more of the deal flow, let's start analyzing a lot more and really, you know, scale up the business. And so it was a 100 unit deal in Atlanta. Um, it was a deal that was a big turnaround. I remember the, the first time we went out to that property, you know, it took my partner Ben about a day to kind of get his head around it, right? I mean, it was a uh, definitely a transitioning part of Atlanta. It's on the Eastern side and it's basically, you know, 15 minutes from downtown. And there's just a lot of other proven business models kind of in that area with apartments. And so, you know, it's a great deal that we, you know, excited about. And really it's a deal that was more complicated. People shied away from it. And so because of that, that was our off, that was our value. How much, uh, how, uh, and how much uh, in uh, CapEx did you have to put in per unit? Uh, we put in, you know, we put in a million dollars into that property. So about 10,000 a door. Wow. And so, the, I mean, the current owners just really, it amazes me how poorly some people will run their properties, right? So this is, this property had nine down units and the down units were basically because it's on the, it's on the edge of a slope. Mm. And the, you know, what that means is that there is a pump that pumps water? sewage. Yeah, pump sewage into the city uh, septic. And, mm. you know, they had that pump fail, it backed up into the units and they've been down for, you know, a year or two. And going out there, we thought this was going to be a $200,000 expense to get, you know, brand new pumps in and, really is $30,000. And, you know, the, the guys that went out and did it, they said that the previous owners had put one pump instead of two. So they didn't have a backup and it was a residential grade instead of commercial. So it surprises me, you know, in my mind, okay, I spend $30,000, but you make $100,000 back that year. 
That's right, a, right. And, and your units being occupied. Wow, that's that's yeah. crazy. I so you're. Let me get this straight. You started a year ago, and you're already at 800 units. You've got 800 more either under contract or or close. Yeah, I mean, wow. so definitely. I mean, my partner had another two years of experience prior to that, and so right. okay. you know, we complement each other and really just add fuel to the fire. Okay, okay, fantastic. Well, let me ask you this: since we're talking about partners, um, are you the you know a lot of partnerships that are very very effective? And and people that listen to my podcast have heard me talk about this many times: is you 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 match up a, an analytical person with um, more of an more of a you know, a, a public facing out, outgoing, you know, investor relations sort of a person are, cause you're kind of both in my opinion. So is, is that, is that the dynamic with Ben or what's the dynamic? Yeah, so, I mean, with Ben, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely the more analytical of the two of us, but I mean, we're both pretty outgoing and it's more right. about, you know, we both understand what the end goal is. We know not to step in each other's toes and we know how to divide and conquer. And so, you know, I'm more of the front line. Let's get out there, talk to more brokers. You know, we both get out to conferences. We both put in the work because, I mean, in this business, none of it is hard, but it's definitely you need to put in the effort and really build up what you're trying to achieve. And so I would say, you know, we both have a kind of an entrepreneurial background, both have a business mindset. And it's about, hey, here's a business. Let's establish the business. Let's grow it like a business. It's not a hobby. Well, let, let me circle back for a second here because this is this is a really big topic in this business because it is such a team sport. So when you first, you know, obviously your, your, your partnership is very successful and very, very quickly. When you first started having conversations, did you, did you, <coughs> excuse me, at what point did you delineate who was responsible for what? How did you divide and conquer? Is this a, an ongoing thing or have you clearly defined who's doing what? So we, we kind of have general sides that we, you know, we, we gravitate towards. And so, you know, for example, I focus a lot more on, you know, finding the deals, meeting with the brokers, really building those relationships. And, you know, once we have something in the pipeline, right, Ben starts to kind of deal with more, okay, let's get the lending going. But really it's about staying in sync. I mean, we, we talk, you know, every day and we divide and conquer. And so right now we have three deals under contract and we had a three hour phone call yesterday and just going about, Hey, here's the different deals. Here's how we're going to accomplish each one. And here's what's missing. And, you know, here you drive this, I'll drive that. And so for example, with those three, Ben is driving all of the lending side. I'm driving all the legal side, right. Mm. And kind of getting, cause that's the first part of the, the process, right? Sure. Okay. Okay. Um, so, okay, well let's pivot now. Um, so you're responsible for finding deals and, you know, the fact that you've got 800 units under contract right now, while everybody else is crying that there's no deals out there, what's, what's, uh, what are we missing? What are, what are the rest of us all missing here, brother? It's hard to find deals, no doubt about it. I mean, you know, it was harder for me to find deals three months, you know, six months ago than it is now. And hmm. it's a couple of things, right? It's no, you know, pick markets that are strong, right? You pick strong macroeconomics because even if you're in the best part of a, you know, not so great area, it's not going to work out. So you bet on the big macroeconomics. But then you start to really look at where, where there's real value to be had. And so, and I speak to this because I'm in Houston. We do not own a single property in Houston. And I'm honestly best friends with one of the highest volume C brokers in Houston. So that tells you something. There's right. a lot of competition in Houston. Deals in Houston are trading for a lot more than, you know, where I can find actual return for our investors. And so that's why we're in Atlanta. Atlanta feels like it's where Houston is two years ago. There's more, there's more deals there. There's less competition. But again, not every deal is a deal. And so it's about cranking up the volume of what you're looking at along with, and the, this is the important thing I think a lot of people forget about. It's not about just calling a broker and say, Hey, how's it going? Do you have anything? All right. Thanks. Bye. I mean, you know, I have notes on every one of the brokers, how many kids they have, what their families are like. And I'm following up honestly, almost weekly. And for any deal that we offer on and we might not win, I follow up again a week and a half later. And so two of these three deals are deals that came back to us. Wow. Guys, I, I just want to—I want to put an exclamation mark on two of the things he just said. This is a lifelong thing you're getting into if you get into the multifamily business. You are setting up relationships for life, and I say—I say the exact same thing from stage. You—you you need to know how many kids they've got. These are friendships. These are relationships. This is a relationship business, and the 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 tighter you make those relationships, the more lucrative your your the relationship's going to be. So uh, love it, and 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 
you know, this is not a get rich quick business. This has become, this has become very, very wealthy over time business, but um, you know, you're going to be doing this for decades and that's like why you treat it. Huh? I like to call it get rich slow. Get rich slow. Yeah, but get very rich slow. Yeah. And, and that's really the truth of it. But, um, but the relationships are critical. So, and, and the other thing I want to draw home is, you know, if you bid on a property, I can't tell you how often, um, you know, we, we get out bid, but then, um, you know, we, we, we stay in communication with that broker. We, we continue to call and you do it weekly. Wow. Uh, and, and then, um, uh, you know, deals come back along because people are trying to overpay. They're not thinking it through and they, and they, and they, they fall out. And, and, uh, that's just very, very common dynamic. So very, very important. You stay in touch with these brokers consistently. All right. And so, other, and one other thing to add to that too, actually. And so, mm -hmm. you know, building that relationship gives you the broker's confidence, but then also because you're staying in contact with them frequently, you're top of mind. And so one of these deals was a deal that the broker literally called me. He's like, Hey, we have this deal. I'm showing it to you and two other people. Here's the price the seller wants. If you can hit it, it's yours. Otherwise it's going to go to market. And you know, we, we were one of three people versus one of 300 people and that's attractive, right? And it's a, it's a phenomenal bet. deal. And so, and then the last thing to add and kind of really tell the audience is a lot of times it's not just about price. And so, and I make that clear to my brokers. I tell them, Hey, here's my price. I can't come up on price because that starts to impact what my investor returns are. Right. And I'm not going to go, you know, tweak the numbers to make it look like a deal. I mean, because really in this right. business. And there's a lot of that going on oh, what you yeah. just said tweak the numbers to make it look like a deal um yeah. especially in this hot market lots of mistakes being made so just you know both eyes sure. wide open guys and it's, okay. this business is all about your reputation mm -hmm. so ben and i are 100 percent big on that and it's about you know i'd rather not get in a deal than get in a deal that i can't confidently report you know uh deliver on and so but i you know i tell the brokers like hey my price is pretty fixed what else can i do on the terms to tweak it and the thing i want to say is don't negotiate for things that you don't need so for example, 30 days due diligence is the norm. We never have submitted a 30 day due diligence clause. Always we're at, you know, 21 days and, you know, to get competitive, we'll do 14 because once you do your onsite due diligence, you, you know, with 90% confidence the day you leave that you're buying or not buying that property. Right. So, you know, I can make this more attractive. I can put more hard money. I put more risk capital, you mm -hmm. know, to get the price that I need. And it's really about kind of combining all these factors to make a deal work. So hard money, shorter due diligence, um, any other, anything else there? Those I mean, I'll, I'll tell them, what is a seller looking for? What is their situation too, right? Cause sometimes you can find creative things to kind of capitalize on that. Maybe it's a big value add and they're running out of money and they've done, you know, there's 10 more units left. They have an upgrade. I'll tell them, look, I'll take it as is. You don't, you don't need to finish it. And there's kind of, you really need to listen to the story because every property has a story. So, so let's talk about for a minute, creativity. Let's talk about, and so it starts with listening to the story. I mean, you, you really, in this business, you are a problem solver and the, the, the best problem solvers are the wealthiest people in this business. So give examples of some times you've been creative or, or you're aware of uh, creative creativity in a deal. I mean, it's about, so a lot of people look at a lot of deals and that's the problem. You look at the deals, you get the T12, you kind of crunch in, oh, this cap rate is kind of low. Okay. I'm going to move on to the next one. But I think right now in this hot market, where everything is on market, there's really, there's no such thing as a true off market deal where you're talking to a seller, not in the bigger, you know, multifamily space. It's always through a broker. And, you know, in that kind of situation, you need to look at the financials, figure out what's wrong with this property, right? What's going on? What can we do differently? And, and I mean by that is really look at the actual line items and know what it should be. I mean, a good example, we have a deal in San Antonio we're buying where their payroll is about almost $2,000 a unit where, the market average should be 1200. So that's an $800 spread per unit of income, really, if you run it correctly, that we can make that just go straight to the bottom line, right? And it's, it's about getting in there and understanding what happened. Some, you know, another example is a deal that had eight fire units that were burned. And so the financials didn't look so great, but those units just came back online. But guess what? If you didn't know that and the broker, which, you know, if the broker didn't mention that or you kind of overlooked that, that's eight units of income you just completely did not account for. And so it's really about, ask the questions, dig into it and spend the time and figure out, okay, I understand where the numbers are now, but really what can be done here to get it to where we want it to be? Right. Right. And, and so, you know, you, for, for example, that San, San Antonio deal, that might've been marketed at a, at a, at a, at a cap rate that 
that didn't look very attractive, but when you dig in and you see the payroll is 800 per unit high, that's a huge swing to the NOI. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, instant value just by, by managing the property more effectively. And that stuff happens, you know, owners <clears throat> will overpay or, you know, they'll hire onsite staff that they love and they overpay them because they've been there forever. And, and it's, it's not uncommon at all. Yeah. And that's just one example, but like, you know, like digging in, to find out that there are, you know, that there are units that uh, that aren't even represented in in the um, in the P and L uh, because of fire, like you said, and or that water problem on the Atlanta property. Oh, exactly. And you dig yeah, deeper, and and there's there's gold there. So okay. Yeah, and I'm, start, I'm starting to see too is that right now people that bought properties in 2012 are exiting. Well, those people, their cost basis is so low that if the thing is not running that great, they're fine with that because guess what they're still making a lot of money. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's that complacency aspect, even so this deal's an institutionally owned deal. And so you think institution is a little more on top of it, but I mean, they're definitely running that very fat. And, you know, we're being conservative on our pro forma, you know, we're saying, okay, they're at 18, we think it could be 12, but really we're modeling it at 1500 because to us that extra 300 that we probably can get to is gravy on the deal. You bet. You bet. And guys, whenever you're dealing with investors, you always under promise and over deliver. That's For sure. Uh, and then they're throwing money at you because, you know, they, you, you, that's just the way to do it. In fact, in any sale period, that's what you should try to do. Um, so now let's talk about what you do. I mean, we've, we've, we've kind of touched on some of these other topics I want to go on, but I want to dig down a little, little bit deeper. So let's go back to analysis for a minute. So, um, you know, maybe walk us through what you, the first things you look at when you get a package from a broker, what, maybe walk us through the sequence of events, if, if, it's, if that's possible. I mean, no, maybe I'd be, be happy to. The first okay. thing I do is actually call the broker and say, all right, before I even dig into this, you know, these are the ones that I have that relationship with. I can do right. this. With. Yeah. What's Tell the me the story, story here, right? right? What's going on? And I always ask, who's the seller? What's their situation? You know, what do you like about this deal? What do you not like about this deal? And like, again, you're spending millions of dollars, especially other people's money, ask the hard questions. Sure. And so, you, you know, get the background of it and then I will take the financials and teach. Okay, I'm sorry, I wanna stop you as you say something that's really profound. Okay, guys, he just asked the broker, what do you like about this deal? What don't you like about that deal? Do you think that'd be a good question to ask? And, 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 and you shut up and let them talk? I mean, that was, that was a, that's a huge tip. Okay, I'm sorry. I just want to flag things that are really important that you say. No, no, happy. Feel free to pause me or stop. Okay. Me. So, you know, from that, we'll take the T12, which is the financials, and start to really dig into that and say, okay, what are they currently operating it at? Is there a discrepancy in where we think we can operate that? And, and think is not thinking, right? I mean, all of this, I'm an analytical guy. I mentioned this earlier. All mm -hmm. of this is backed by data. You get on the phone with your property manager in Atlanta who happened to, for example, literally manage the deal across the street previously. And I tell them, Hey, what were you running that deal at? Because right. same vintage line by line, line exactly. by line. What, what should we expect here on uh, for repairs and maintenance? What should yeah. we expect for, you know, for landscaping? What should we expect for uh, right on down the line? Yes, exactly. And then, so, right. you know, you're getting a feel for, are they running it lean or fat? Cause you sometimes you see people that or they're running it you know, at a price point that no one will ever run it at. I mean, you know, someone that's self-managing that, right. you know. Right. They're so, mowing their own, their own grass. And, and Yeah, and it goes both ways. And I have a story about that. I have a deal that I looked at in Atlanta where the seller told the broker, let's push back the, the property tour an hour so he can get someone out there to mow the grass because he, it was one of the worst looking properties I had ever seen because he does not spend the money for anything. But he knew, he, you know, I was coming to take a look. Let me go pretend like the grass gets cut. And standing there, me, my property manager, and our contractor got approached by four different people asking us, hey, are you guys the owner? Can I cut these bushes and you pay me? Because it's just, it was insane to see, you know, but his expenses were super lean, right? But it's- Sure, really sure. Uh, we, we, had, we had a property like that in Kentucky we looked at. It was, it was this obvious, uh, you know, that, that it, was, it was way, way lean um, because of the owner's active involvement. So, okay, so, so line by line, uh -huh. um, and continue that. that yeah, you know. so then continuing from that. So then you get a feel for where expenses are at. Then the more important thing is figure out what does the market look like? And what I mean by that is that if the property is below market and you think, okay, the property next door is getting, you know, 10 cents more a square foot. The first question is why? And I literally, I'll go back to the broker and say, why is the, what we call the, you know, the economic occupancy so low, right? Why is there such a spread? And the broker, you'll hear a lot of different answers. 
But, you know, that's something you keep in the back of your mind is if there is a spread, you know, figure out why. Talk to your property manager, talk to the broker, and then, you know, you get out there and take a look. But um, really, you start to pull comps, you know. And I mean, by comps, I mean, you're, I literally get on the phone with some of these properties because you get CoStar reports. And for any of, those, that, that any of you that don't know this, usually your lender will give that to you for free. You know, there's kind of a lot of different ways to get the reports. And, you know, from that you'll get a feel for what the general market is, but I will call the properties nearby and figure out what are they offering both concessions and rents and get a feel amenities, for it. Exactly amenity, what I meant. It's got to be apples to apples guys. It's, it's critical that it's apples to apples. And it's funny because you know, on these calls you try to make yourself sound like a tenant as well. So you're trying to creatively ask some of these questions where you're almost, you know, you don't want to ask what's your occupancy at because a tenant's right. never going to ask that, but you're really fishing for all that information and figure out, okay, you know, now if I bump not to market, but if I bump close to market, does the deal perform, right? Because Ben and I, we really look for high cash flow deals. We do not bet on appreciation. And I think right. that's something I'm starting to see a lot more in Texas where these deals are just, the margins are so tight. that they're And they're, best- they've got their 3% a year, but you yeah. know, listen, when we pull back, that 3% is going to evaporate for a while. Exactly. And so, you know, so then that gets to really the, the most important number, I would say, in a model. If, you know, if any investors are out there looking at financials from, a, you know, from any sponsor or syndicator, look at what the exit cap is, you mm-hmm. know, the, the reversion cap, because that is a number that you could change a quarter of a point and it can make a bad deal look good. Let me, let me, let me, let me just, um, for, the, for the real newbies here, uh, say what, what he's talking about is, you know, when you're doing your pro forma on, on the property's performance, typically, You'll, um, you'll show a sale in five years, for example, and you're going to have a cap rate uh, for that sale, and that's called an exit cap. And if you show a cap rate uh, similar to what you bought it at, then you're, first of all, you're crazy. Yeah. Uh, and second of all, um, you're going to have a big wake-up call because as interest rates go up, cap rates will go up. So, um, you know, let, let, so, so let me just ask you, when you're stress testing a deal and you, you put that exit cap in, what do you typically do? And then I also want to talk about what else you do to stress test the deal. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, we, we do it to point to a point and a half. And it's mm-hmm. not so much the price we're buying it at because I'm okay with buying a property at a lower cap if the property has a story that I can get it to where year one, I'm at a cap I'm happy with. And so right. I look more about where the market cap is. Right, the so, market okay, cap. And you go a point or a point and a half above. A, mm-hmm. Exactly. We're buying at a six. We're going to exit at, you know, maybe seven and a quarter. Mm-hmm. And so we look at the different kind of breakdown. And, you know, again, we're looking for cash flow. And that's what our investors like, right? It's these high cash flow deals that market tanks, guess what? We're still producing, you know, revenue for everyone, right? Right. We're not worried about, can we even pay off our note? And so. Right, um, right, right. So what do you do to stress test as far as, you know, rents and occupancy. Yeah. So a couple of different things. So, you know, you can tell where occupancy is at currently where, you know, you talk to your property manager, you get a feel for what that sub market looks like, but then, you know, we assume, Hey, if, you know, occupancy drops, let's come down from, you know, 90%, maybe our 90, let's say, let's go down to 85. And on top of that, let's also drop rents, to, you know, 8%. What happens, right? right? Does the deal support itself? And you're really, right. you know, grinding these numbers and looking at it from all different cases. Cause guess what? I, you know, this is other people's money I'm playing with. It's not my money. I'm not going to go out and take a risk because I just won't get in the deal if it's not that. Right. Exciting. No, you've so. got, and guys, when I say stress testing, what we're doing is we're looking to see what happens if there's a pullback. Yeah. And, and for those of you who don't understand that term, and you've got to stress test a deal because, you know, there's going to be a pullback. It may have already started. Who knows? But, but um, uh, so, so 15% vacant, uh, you know, uh, 8% drop in rents, you know, that's pretty, that's, that's pretty, that's about what we do as well. So, yeah. so we're, we're lined there. Awesome. So anything else on the analytical side before I yeah, move into the management? About, you know, it's about looking at real financials from other well-running properties. So to, mm. to give you an example, we have a property in Beaumont that we actually just sold last week, mm. you know, home run deal worked out really well, but we bought the property that's across the street at a better location a few months ago. So mm. not only did we have real financials from a deal that we owned and we knew what we could run it at, we also just created our own comp as well, right? By selling right. that property. And, nice. you know, we knew day one that, hey, this is where rents are currently with the owners that, you know, they bought it again. This is a deal they bought right at the bottom of the recession. They don't care if it's, you know, how, how efficient it's being run. They're making so much money already, right? right? So there's a lot of fat on that deal. The rents are really low and really it's the ugliest property in the area. And so where we had a property running efficiently, running well, producing, you know, great results. So we knew what we could do with that property. And so, and, you know, again, maybe some of your listeners don't have a property nearby, but talk to your property managers. And I mean that 
you know, they're one of your biggest partners in this deal, right? Your two biggest partners are your lender and your property manager. Right, so, right, right. And, you know, and guys, possible. and guys, those of you listening, pay attention to how he's describing those relationships. He's describing them as partnerships because they really are. And, and, and that's the mindset you have to have with your lender and with your third party property manager. If, if, if you, that's how you're going to do this business, which is what I recommend when you get, when you get going and get started, you, you know, and I've, you know, I've had lots of people on the show with thousands of units that are centrally located and then they take their management in house and, and they like to do it themselves. But um, we're going to talk about third party management a little more here in just a second. Um, well, let's just get right into it. Let's, let's talk about that now. So, so, um, uh, you know, you treat them as partners. And um, actually, that's what I was, I, I knew I had a thought. I, I want to circle back to what you just said. So you can get financials that have been redacted on properties near you. Just say, you know, cut out the names of the people. I just want to know how these, pro you know, how properties are running around me or near me. And, and, and most property managers will give you that information. Um, or, or you get, you know, you get offering memorandums from other properties, but Ideally, you want to get them from property managers. Yes. Yeah, and like I tell everyone, it does not hurt to ask. The, the worst right. they'll say is no, and that's fine. And another right. trick that I've done too is, you know, we look at, I mean, there, I get disappointed if there's a deal I hear about in Atlanta that gets sold that I had not seen before, at least, or heard about. And I really, genuinely, I, I start to wonder who, where did that come from? Who did I miss? Right. But, you know, by looking at these other properties that are going for sale, guess what? You can look at those financials too. Right. And, you know, those are free. You know, you don't have to right. ask anyone. Right. They're there and right. ready to roll. Right. Um, and, and I want to flag something else you just said. Okay. Do you guys hear that attitude? Okay. You pick a market and he gets irritated if a property sells he's unaware of. Okay. When you have that kind of attitude that, that everything that goes for sale comes across your desk, do you think you're a better position to, to, to build up to what looks like 1600 units here in one year, a year and a half, uh, two years. And I know your goal is another thousand a year and there's no question in my mind, you're going to achieve it. So, yeah. <clears throat> So it's a funny story on that. There was a deal actually a couple months ago that I had saw someone on Facebook had posted about, you know, having roughly 800 units under contract. And it was a specific unit number, right? And, you know, unit numbers tend to click for me and also sure. brokers tend to know every deal in a market. And I literally texted one of the brokers that I know that, you know, should know most deals. And I, I'm like, hey, what deal just traded that's this many units? He's like, I don't know any deal with that many units. And so it was really starting to rub me the wrong way of like, where did this deal come from? Right. And then later I find out this person had two deals under contract combined. They were that thing. And so then gotcha. I asked the broker and then we knew what deals they were. So, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, no, you're right. You, you, you kind of remember, you don't remember the names of the properties. You remember the unit counts. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, so let's talk about the relationship with your third party manager uh, and, and how you develop that, how you utilize them. I mean, you've already talked about some of the ways uh, but, but, but can you drill down on that a little more? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I get asked that a lot because again, we're in Houston, our, you know, chunk of our properties on Atlanta. And, you know, the first thing to get into any market, we don't get into a market unless we have, you know, a team there, your property manager, GC, you know, who are you using? And so for Atlanta, we had a partner who had properties there, had already gone through a lot of different property managers to find the one that he's, you know, used and respected and, you know, really enjoyed with. And so, you know, we kind of cheated in the sense that we didn't have to go through a lot of different ones. But, you know, that's kind of a separate point. The really the thing that's important is once you find your property manager, it's about staying on top of the deal, right? Your property manager, yes, they are a partner, but they don't make a lot of money on property management, right? You are giving them control of this multi-million dollar asset. And sometimes, you know, the, the person at the desk is a 20, 30 year old person, right? And so you really you know, as good as a property manager is, it's also your responsibility to stay involved. And what I mean by that is that we're out there every month. Thankfully, there's easy flights from Houston to Atlanta. I found right. that I can take a 5.45 a.m. flight, spend a whole day in Atlanta, be back on a flight and sleep back in my bed, you know, that night. Well, that's beautiful. And I mean, you're blessed because Atlanta's Delta's hub. Yeah. So, I'm, you know, anytime I want to go anywhere and I love Delta, I, I always go through Atlanta. So it's kind of a no brainer. So, so you got to make sure your team's in place. Um, you know, what sorts of things should you look for with a property manager, Ferris? Yeah, oh, I mean, really, it's your rapport with them to begin with, right? Do you gel with them? Because this is a long-term relationship. Do you guys understand each other? The next mm -hmm. thing is, you know, whenever I ask them stuff about, I guess, ask them, hey, can you give me a budget for this property, right? You'll get a feel for how, how they treat you because that's an indication of how that relationship will be once that turns into a, a deal that they're managing, right? Mm. And I mean, to me, it's also what I'm starting to learn compared to, because we have different property managers, different deals is really, 
I start, I like property managers that are more nimble, not ones that have a hidden off accounting department somewhere locked away in a room that you can't really talk to. I like the property manager that, you know, they know the regional knows, Hey, you know, we're going to hold, we're not going to pay this invoice until a little bit later. Cause we're going to have, you know, just to keep more cash on hand really knows how to roll with it. Right. And so you really want to match property managers to deal asset classes. Mm. Some property managers can handle a great, beautiful, brand new, a luxury wraparound, but they don't know how to handle a C it's a different tenant base, different kind of property, different needs. And so really asking them, what else do you manage in the area? What kind of, you know, let me see pictures of them and I'll just drive them myself. Do I feel like this is being run well and kind of get a feel for how they, they do that. But to me, it's communication. So we require every one of our things we have, you know, every Friday, 10 o'clock so tomorrow, t- uh, sorry, nine o'clock, my time, 10 o'clock, their time. We're on the phone for an hour, hour and a half going through our deals, going through the financials, going through what the weekly looks like. Then every Monday we get reports and we're digging into all those. Cause again, as nice as it is to get new deals, operations is your reputation. And so you have to really make sure you're staying on top of that. And so, you know, once a deal is stabilized, it becomes a little bit less of, you know, the, of a kind of workload, but you still need to stay on top of it because, you know, a thing to you that to them that might be kind of irrelevant, like, yeah, I'll just pay another thousand dollars for this plumbing issue. That's a thousand dollars. I mean, I do the math of like, well, if our, you know, if our income for that property is 15,000 for the month, you know, after a bottom line, after all bills paid, after debt service, et cetera, that's one fifteenth that we just kind of left on the table. Right. And it's easy to say, well, look, it's a $4,000 invoice, but let's go get another bid. Maybe it's 3000. And we see that time and time after again. So you really need to put in your rules about what you expect from them and just lay it out up front. They're a partner. This is how I like to play. Is this okay with you? And to be honest, our Atlanta property manager has been phenomenal. One of the, the best that we've and So, so you haven't like jumped ship. It's been the same manager since yeah, they- I mean, they've been fantastic. And they give us the confidence to do any deal in Atlanta, honestly, mm-hmm. whether it's a big turnaround, whether it's a nice stabilized deal. I mean, it's, you know, we've built a lot of rapport and, you know, we grow with them. They grow with us. It's a, it's, it's a mutual relationship. No, that's the way it should be. Love the way you described it. All right. So let me ask you this. If you could go back a year, just one year, since that's all you've been doing this, is there anything you might've done differently? Anything you do differently in this business or, or maybe even go back further in time. You I know, I was say, here, I would have started sooner. Is that the answer to that question? Oh, I think that's the answer. Most people realize yeah. once you get into you know, people, yes, it's, it's a hard business. There's a lot going on, but it's also, it's all, you know, controllable, right? If you have a good mentor or a friend or a partner or a coach, right, you can kind of avoid the pitfalls and it's a lot of steps in the process, but you take them one at a time. So would have loved to start sooner. And as we've grown, I think the thing we've also kind of landed on really is trying to pick up properties that are not as big of value add. And the reason I say that is because, you know, two different deals we have, one of them is a big value add. The other one, you know, fairly stabilized. We're doing an interior upgrade, but not all over the place, changing everything. Right. The smaller value add takes up triple the time as the other one, you know, of our time. Right. And so that's another one. I'm that, sorry, the smaller value add? Yeah, because, uh, no, no, the smaller deal that is a bigger value add. Oh, yeah, bigger value yeah, add. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of course, it takes triple the time. It's, it's and, just, and, and you get exhausted and it, it's, it's consuming. And so, no, I get it. But- yeah you know, obviously everybody's looking for the best deal. They can make the most money they can. And, and usually that requires some, some, some. Yeah. Uh, this day and age, I mean, every deal is going to be a value add. It's just the kind right. of value add really, you know, pick what you want to roll with. And then, you know, and getting out to even more conferences, right. You know, I mean, we go to a ton every year, get out to all the events you can, the events that are in Tampa, the events that are in Texas, the events that are in Atlanta, you know, sure. really, Put sure. together a, what guys, we call a hit guys, list. I'm, I'm going to be in Tampa January 18th, 19th, and 20th. And this is the stuff we go through. People yeah. like Ferris on stage and we just drill down. I mean, I'm teaching for three days, but we have these panels and this is the kind of stuff we do on the panels. And I, I'm sure you can see the value in that. So go to multifamilybootcamp.com and join us in Tampa. There's still tickets left. Um, but uh, so, you know, um, go, go to events, um, network, build those relationships, nurture those relationships. Um, and any other words of wisdom <clears throat> you could give someone that maybe hasn't pulled the trigger yet, knows they should be doing this. You know, what would you say to that person? Oh, the, the easiest thing maybe is there's a lot of steps in the process. You don't have to do it all yourself, right? right. Partner with people. And I'll give you real examples. I mean, we had, you know, a nice big deal that we were closing. You know, we have some friends that we know are people that work hard, people that we trust, people that we, you know, that we want to invest in, right? 
and we bring them on and say, hey, how about you do this deal with us, right? They're adding value by either putting up hard money, maybe they're helping raise, whatever it is. But they bring their resume, they bring their yeah, network, getting, they're getting their feet wet, and we give them that. And, you know, we agree with them, like, hey, we'll give you the visibility into the process. And doing mm -hmm. that one deal, you learn so much from it. And so, you know, I, I, I kind of like to say that Ben and I have gone to the point where we're almost glorified matchmakers, right? We, we find deals and we find different sources of team members, whether it's equity or anything, and we start to figure out how do we combine these together, yeah. right? And so, I mean, because Ben and I cannot do three deals at one time, just us two, right? We definitely right. bring on more people and it's a big pie. And that's, I guess, what's attractive to me about the business is that it's a numbers business, but it's a relationship business. And it's about how do you slice up the pie to where everyone is, you know, getting value and happy with it as well. Yeah. Yeah. We, we do the exact same thing. Uh, you know, it, it, we consider ourselves matchmakers as well. We have so many deals that come to us from students and listeners and everything else. And, and then we've got so many people with money. It's kind of like putting, putting, putting the pieces together and, and we can be very, very selective and, and you're doing the same thing, which is awesome. So, um, well, listen, uh, you have added tremendous value today, my friend, and I'm looking forward to seeing you here in short order at our yeah. mastermind. And, uh, um, uh, guys, if you're interested in connecting uh, with Ferris, it's disruptequity.com. And um, thanks for being on the show, brother. It's such a treat to have you. Oh, no problem. Thank you for having me, Rod. Definitely appreciate it. All See right, you buddy. Florida. All right. Talk to you soon, my friend. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a minute to visit iTunes and leave your comments. For more resources or to connect with us further, please visit our website at rodcleef.com. Tune in next week for our next show.